pause for another moment of prayer and ask the Spirit of God to teach us the Word of God. Father, we, we do pause again because we do realize our, the, our feeble efforts are at best feeble. We're dependent upon you. We're dependent upon your grace. We're dependent upon your indwelling spirit to illuminate our hearts and our eyes, our minds to your truth. Not only to affirm your truth, but to understand what it looks like with shoe leather on it. God, help us never to delude ourselves by thinking that we can hear your word and not do it. And so, Lord, would you convict us of sin, exhort us towards righteousness, speak to your church as we just sang, and accomplish life change, make us more like Jesus today than we were last week. I would be cautious to give you all the praise in your son's name. Amen. Well, if you take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 5, we'd like to look at an exposition that I've titled Retaliation, Rights, and Requirements of Christ. It's all about a retaliation, but it's not the kind that is left to mortal man and his own fleshiness. It's a retaliation in kindness. The disciples of Jesus, those that profess Him as Savior and Lord of their lives, are remarkably different when they are wronged than typical unbelievers. You may recall the story of Moby Dick, Herman Melville's novel in 1851. For hardy whalers, no ocean was too wide to cross in pursuit of their mighty prizes. In 1819, more than a dozen ships were launched from Nantucket, all headed for distant Pacific hunting grounds. One, the three-masted Essex, was to suffer a calamity so dramatic that its fate inspired that classic American novel that we know as Moby Dick. When King Ahab's cold, vicious pursuit of revenge, uh, he wanted more than his pound of flesh, or should we call it a pound of blubber, coming from that whale. For months, the ship survived the hazards of rounding Cape Horn and taking its prey. But one day, a mammoth sperm whale rammed the Essex head-on, And then the Leviathan passed under the vessel, turned and attacked again. The whale hit, as first mate Owen Chase recalled, quote, with tenfold fury and vengeance. The crew abandoned ship and from their whale boats watched as the Essex slid into the sea. So here you've got a whale with his tenfold fury and vengeance and then was chased by Ahab with his retaliation. Lex talionis was the law of retaliation in kind for crimes committed. By definition, it is to pay back in kind like for like. It brings up the issue of rights, something that is espoused in our own country as well as abroad as something that's God-given. Don't tread on me would be our bumper sticker for life. Man claims rights for everything imaginable. Civil rights, woman's rights, whether it be female pastors or the right to abortion, a.k.a. murder of a baby in the womb that after 40 years, praise God, in answering the prayers of the saints was overturned on Friday. Amen and amen. The sanctity of human life stood for that it's no longer a constitutional right to kill. Well, we're talking about rights, civil rights, women's rights, children's rights, workers' rights, students' rights, prisoners' rights, and the list goes on and on and on. Never has a society been more concerned with rights than ours. Above all, sinful man wants what he thinks is his own, and in the process of getting it, he's inclined to wreak havoc on anyone who gets in the way, especially one who takes what is his. Retaliation is the result, and usually with interest exacted. But when self is worshipped, everyone... And things is trampled. Justice is replaced with vengeance. 
concern for protecting society is replaced with protecting self-interest. Now, as you've made your way to Matthew 5, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 constitutes the longest written sermon of Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount. And probably no text, no, th no paragraph, no thought in this sermon has suffered as greatly from misinterpretation and misapplication as the verses before us in verses 38 to 42. There's a view that basically renders Christians as sanctimonious doormats. As these verses are quoted out of context, missing the entire emphasis of our Savior. Matter of fact, its last two contrasts are over-the-top teachings from our Lord that espouse the heart of or expose the the heart of hypocritical religion of which the Pharisees practiced, and many in our own day and age practice a hypocritical religion. Maybe some of you which is external and partial and redefined and selfish. So we'll quote the law as long as it serves my purpose. Beloved, I want you to learn from Jesus the higher way of responding to wrong. Not according to the law and rights, but according to love and kindness. Learn to retaliate in kindness from the heart, something that was incapable that the scribes and Pharisees were incapable of. Matthew 5, would you follow along as I read for us, beginning in verse 38. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Now last week we had looked at the, the law's demands. The, man needs the righteousness of Christ, not what he can work up from within himself. We need a superior righteousness. Nobody in first century was the bigger picture for the Jews of righteousness than the scribes and Pharisees. They taught the taught, taught what they taught, but they didn't walk the walk. They said, but didn't do. It was uh, an ob obedience that is on the external. It is the letter of the law, not the spirit of the law. Yeah, we'll quote it as long as it's advantageous to us without the heart ever being changed. We need a greater righteousness than the best examples of Judaism provided for those who fastidiously followed the law and added on man's made traditions. It was external, the best man can offer. And yet you get to the end of this chapter and Jesus sums it all up. He says, you're to be perfect as your Father in heaven is. That's the bar. That's the standard that's been set. Nothing below that standard of absolute perfection. And as we've said from the holy desk here before, there's only one right answer to Jesus' demand. I can't. It's to humble us. The law is to humble us with our breaches and our disobedience. We need to be devastated so that we come to the cross with nothing in our hands we bring simply to His cross we cling. It's the perfections of Christ and Christ alone. Jesus taught His disciples about what it's like to be citizens of His kingdom and how this inner righteousness, not theirs naturally, but a given righteousness, speaking of their desires and what they do, their beliefs and how they behave. So His lesson is found in verse 38, the law's proper teaching on retaliation. Now this principle of lex talionis, it's the, that's the Latin for the law of retribution, it's laid down in the Old Testament for civil courts. 
that the seeking of private revenge or being a vigilante would not would, would be discouraged. Bring it to the court. They'll be settled. It was a court matter to assuage the perpetrator and provide the nation's judicial system with a ready formula of punishment. It was to limit retaliation and to punish fairly, to limit vendettas. And the reason there has to be a high court intervention is because human vengeance is never satisfied. You want a pound of flesh, and once you get a pound of flesh, how about you give me another pound? And the next time you wrong me, I'll give you a history lesson of all the ways you have always wronged me. It's what the world calls bearing the hatchet. So the next time you wrong me, I go grab the handle, which is unburied. It's still above ground, and uh, it's not a promise of pardon, which is the forgiveness we're given in the Father through the Son. So the flesh wants a pound, or people want a pound of the flesh for an ounce of offense. And that's one reason why God restricts re uh, vengeance to himself. He says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And it was not given to foster vengeance. Back in Exodus chapter 21 would be one that these men would lead into. The, the law of Moses teaches in Exodus 21 and verses 24 and 25. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Notice that for every assault, there is an equal payment. Not more, not less, eye for eye, foot for foot. Okay, we, we get that. So over in Leviticus 24, verse number 20, it's reiterated, fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, just as he has injured a man, so it shall be inflicted on him. So when somebody wrongs you, it's not your opportunity uh, with your ambulance chasing lawyer to get rich. And you might mark down another reference, Deuteronomy 19.21. So please note, as I've mentioned, that the, the purpose was not to encourage retaliation. It was to control excesses. The law was to restrain you from going out in all your passion, with all your venom and your hatred, to exact justice in your own eyes. But let justice be administered publicly, and the payment should exactly fit the crime. All it provided was a right to take the person to court, not to seek revenge. It's public, not private. It's controlled, not uncontrolled. So the law made it public, not private. You couldn't exact more than it cost you. The abuse, however, in the hands of the Pharisees was that it was ripped from its context and intended um, its intended purpose. It was used to justify personal retribution and revenge. So what was given for public law was used in passionate outbursts for private action. They quoted this to defeat its whole purpose. After all, personal vengeance was forbidden back in Leviticus 19 and verse number 18. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. In a study not too many weeks ago, when we looked at in, in the Gospel of Mark of Jesus' summary of the law, what, how can you summarize all the 600 plus commandments? Love God and love your neighbor. Almost every sin in life is a breach of love either towards God or towards our, our neighbor. And so as vengeance is forbidden, love for neighbor was assured. Over in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 20 
and verse number 22. Do not say, I will repay evil. Wait for the Lord, and He will save you. Proverbs 24, 29. You know, in other words, you're taking the, the law into your own hands. Proverbs 24, 29. Do not say, thus I shall do to him as he has done to me. I will render to the man according to his work. So we're, we're to wait on our sovereign God. Isn't it amazing how that the Spirit's ministry is conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and He's got a much bonier finger of conviction than you and I can when we try playing Holy Spirit. So it awaits for the Lord. So in Jesus' day, in the first century, lex talionis, retaliation according to the law, became justification for vindictiveness. If one was stricken, they were to let the judiciary administer the just return slap, but that wasn't happening. You know, when, when there is not a restraint of evil, it is neither just nor kind, and I wish I could jump up on a soapbox and spend the next three sermons of my life addressing the horrors of our society, and we, as we've looked at the biblical principles for government, punish the evildoer. It's not just to withhold capital punishment that God Himself enacted. So not to restrain evil is neither just nor kind, and so there was that mediation provided through the, the judicial system. It fails to protect the innocent and has the effect of encouraging the wicked in their evil. Proper restraint of evil not only is just, but beneficial. And uh, again, I'm trying to behave and not step up in a soapbox about what happened on Friday when uh, Roe v. Wade was overturned. Roe v. Wade never should have happened in the first place. The womb ought to be the most safe place on planet Earth. Who's going to stand up from, for the silent ones? A.W. Pink says, Magistrates and judges were never ordered by God for the purpose of reforming reprobates or pampering degenerates, but to be His instruments for preserving law and order by being a terror to evil. You know, when, when, you know, when you're coming down the, the hill into Central Point and you, you see the lights going, the person that, that drew out the popo this morning so that we wouldn't get the ticket, right? Uh, you ought to be stopped short and the little shaking going on. There's not that fear in our day. There ought to be. Romans 13 says, uh, uh, I guess I get back to quoting Pink so he can be the one in trouble, not me. Uh, he says, they are to be a revenger to execute wrath on him that doeth evil. Conscience has become comatose. The requirements of justice are stifled. Maudlin concepts now prevail. As eternal punishment was repudiated, either tacitly or in many cases openly, ecclesiastical punishments are shelved. Churches refuse to enforce sanctions and wink at flagrant offenses. The inevitable outcome has been the breakdown of discipline in the home, the creation of public opinion, unquote, which is mawkish and spineless. School teachers are intimidated by foolish parents and children so that the rising generation are more and more allowed to have their own way without fear of consequences. And if some judge has the courage of his convictions and sentences a brute for maiming an old woman, there's an outcry against the judge. Unquote. Hope you pray for our believing friends who are in the public school system because there's no... Yes. Ain't good. So retaliation was done in a new way. It needs to be done in accordance with the kingdom of God and righteousness by kingdom kids being salt and light. That's Jesus' lesson to them in the Sermon on the Mount. Illustration number one that he follows the, the principle up with, verse number 39. Matthew 5, 39. You know, so he'd start off in verse 38. You've heard it, that it was said. So this was Mosaic law that they 
would, they could quote you chapter and verse even before the chapters and verses were there because that was a more modern contrivance to Scripture. You've heard it said, and he begins this next verse with, I say to you. Jesus, as a teacher, is not quoting another rabbi. He is preaching with inherent authority with, I say unto you. That's why it's good that in the earlier on in the, parag- in the chapter, he had said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fill it full. And that's exactly what he's doing in his teaching here. But before getting into the illustration is this command not to resist an evil person. So before we can even get to the illustration, he gives another command not to resist an evil person. What does Jesus mean by that? Because there are a lot of people in church history like the Anabaptists, the Quakers, and Mennonites who have taken this passage literally as proof for passivism but we need to read it in context of what follows in verses 43 to 48, which is not the scope of our study this morning. You see, these two paragraphs are connected. And the key would be in verse 44, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. It's not that you can't defend self or defend those who have no other defense as it's administered with love and kindness. You know, this is tough love. Take this in the home scenario for us parents. There's a lot of tough love moments we have to do. But to swat your child on the rear end as being obedient to the Bible and teaching them that unless you turn from your own ways, you're probably going to bust hell wide open when you die because it's a far worse consequence than corporal punishment in the home. It's punishment for eternity from God the Father. So this is not proof for passivism. He's not confronting the fact of dealing with wrong, but he is condemning the spirit of lovelessness and hatred and yearning for revenge that pervaded false religion of that day and does so in a lot of legalism in our day. It's that graceless spirit of condemnation rather than reconciliation. This is real practical. You know, when somebody cuts you off when you're driving or any number of other illustrations of life where somebody's just being, do I I dare say jerk behind the pulpit? Like this this is a real issue. They inconvenience you. And we want to get in a rage naturally, because we are totally depraved sinners, even though we've been forgiven and redeemed. This is a constant fight, a constant battle with our fleshiness. This is where we live. See how practical this text is? In other words, don't resist the measures that arise from an unloving, unforgiving, unrelenting, vindictive disposition. You know, rather than my rights have been trampled on, let's go to court. Jesus said, you've heard it said. Yeah, you've got the court system you can utilize. It's a very public thing. Recall what he's already taught. You know, earlier in verses 23 to 26. When you recall that your brother's got something against you, leave your gift at the altar. Stop your worship, in other words. Go be reconciled. Be reconciled quickly. And the context is the courtroom scene. Less to be turned over to the torturers. Jesus uh, places a high premium on reconciliation. There ought not be anybody that we have a rift with that we have not sought biblical reconciliation with. Notice what I didn't say. Paul says, live at peace with all men such as lies within you. You might make every attempt to honor and obey Jesus and you might get shut down. Well, that's on the other person, not on you. Be reconciled. Do it quickly. Because otherwise, the bitterness tank starts brewing and filling up. We're talking about gospel grace of demonstrating forgiveness and forbearance and patience. Waiting on God and leaving it 
for him to punish and to control the event, even if through legal channels that he's already established in the Mosaic economy. The believer is forbidden to descend to the level of the aggressor in returning evil for evil. It's a renouncing of this perceived right. we got a right to confront with violence. No, that's been set aside through faith in Christ where we're trusting God for justice, that He'll meet out in His time and in His, in His way. You know, my thoughts are drawn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 15. 1 Thessalonians 5.15 See that no one, do we need to exegete in the original language what no one means? See that no one repays another with evil for evil. Always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. That is a high standard. That's not an enjoyable standard as we want to please the flesh. But that is what Christ has called us to. Looking at the command through the wide context of the Gospel of Matthew, Christ is the fulfillment of the law. He's the crescendo, the climax, what the whole Old Testament looked forward to in eschatological hope. Even Lex Talionis, back in the, the Law of Moses, pointed forward to Christ and His teaching. Jesus now taught how divorce, for instance, is a mere concession to the hardness of man's heart and sin. So was lex talionis, retaliation. It was to curb the evil atrocities of wicked men. John Piper put it this way, quote, God gives by concession a legal regulation. Can we go back to Moses and the law in court? Yeah, absolutely. Well, anyways, he said uh, God gives by concession a legal regulation as a dam against the river of violence which flows from man's evil heart. Are there provisions? Since I mentioned uh, divorce, are there provisions? Yeah, there's sexual adult. You know, there's adultery. There's desertion by an unbeliever. As a biblical counselor, somebody comes to my my office, do I automatically say, open the Bible and say, "Hey, here's your right. Here's your opportunity that God Himself has allowed." No, you don't. How about the the high road? This is a great opportunity for the gospel to be on display. Do we have rights? Absolutely, we've got rights. But how are we trusting God through those events to minister and to mete out justice that we cannot? See, the Old Testament prophets, they taught and they looked for a time that there'd be change of heart among God's people. Living under the New Covenant, we looked at several of these last week in, in Jeremiah 31 and 32 and Ezekiel 36. That there was coming a time, which now is, of the New Covenant. Not only to be forgiven of sin, but that obedience wouldn't be exacted from the outside, but from the inside. Compelled from within. The law stood as a capital L law over God's people. Do this and don't do that. God says there's coming a time that I'm going to write my law in their hearts. And that, my friends, is what hypocritical religion could not get their minds around. This is the exceeding righteous demands to get into God's kingdom. The law produces guilt of I can't do it, which places us in humility at the cross of Christ where it is finished. We can stand on the grounds of His righteousness that has been credited to our account by faith. We rely on Him, not what we can administer to protect our rights. Not unopposed evil and allowing it to run its course, but answering evil with good 
You can call this a retaliation in kindness is the way of the kingdom. Confrontation, many times needed. But the retribution or response is that of forgiveness and generosity. Loving kindness in action. That as we receive loving kindness from our forgiven Father, so we bestow on others. It's only possible with a life transformed and a heart that's been released from sinful desires and empowered to obey God and love Him from the heart. His love's already been shed abroad in our hearts through Christ. And this is a huge task that is met through Christ alone. And so there are four illustrations to clarify Jesus' point and kind of drive it home of what it looks like in daily life. He said, somebody slaps you beside on the sleep slaps you on the cheek. Give him the other. Notice again what Jesus is not saying. You can you can picture the legalists of Jesus' day. Not being a human doormat, as has often been promoted from this text. It means rather showing in attitude and word and deed that you're you're not filled with bitter ill will or resentment. You're filled with a spirit of love. Going to stand on biblical grounds and rights and justice, but do so in a kind and loving manner. Many times it's not the actions that trip us up, it's the attitudes. And we stew in our attitudes long enough that's going to come out in our demonstrations. So this indicates not just pain, but gross insult. How would you like to be in the front of your class in school? And back in the day when they would have a rod to wrap your knuckles and to be the one that is in front of everyone, be backhanded. It's not the the sting of the slap that hurts so much, it's being humiliated in front of everyone. Your great commentary here would be Romans 12, verses 19 to 21, where the Apostle Paul says to the saints at Rome who are learning how to put off their sinful habits and replace them with the righteous ones as kingdom citizens, he says in Romans 12, 19, never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it's written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. If your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You know, those burning coals on the head of God's judgment are when believers do not return in kind the kind of insults and injuries they just received. And that's what causes people to see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. It's like they may deny our Christianity, but they take notice that this is, this is just weird. What has gotten a hold of you? Jesus says, turn the other cheek. Do you realize how over the top this is? Not only a refusal to retaliate, but also placing yourself in a degrading and vulnerable situation. Not what we deserve, that we like to fight for, but intentionally and aggressively dying to self. Taking the place of dishonor rather than satisfying the flesh with appraisal. And before we move on to illustration number two that our Savior gives us here, you just, just think about this. In the next intense moment of fellowship you have with your spouse, or the next intense parenting moment you have with your children, that... Uh, Sometimes God does more through the dishonor of the situation than the honor. We can win the war in that, or the the skirmish in that argument and lose the whole war. Was it really worth it? Well, it sure did feel good, yeah. But it pandered to the flesh. So he gives a second illustration to kind of show what it looks like in practice in verse 40. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, 
Speaking of your, um, your inner garment, well, give me your outer garment too. Over the top generosity. That's not common to man. You know, there's a Latin proverb that says, if one sues you for an egg, give him the hen also. You know, that'll preach. Somebody sues you, legally sues you, to take your shirt. You know, the person Jesus is addressing is not suing, but being sued for alleged debt. As I said, the shirt was the, the tunic worn next to the body, not the outer one. And so again, with Jesus going over the top in His teaching here, Rather than resentfully contest the lawsuit, allow the plaintiff to have your outer robe as well, which was considered in indispensable. If you're a poor person, you're going to use your outer garment just for cover at nighttime. And Jesus said it would be better in the court for you to appear naked, figuratively speaking, than to be clothed and uh, have your way. Under the law, this outer cloak could be kept. It's bare necessity if you're a poor person. But Jesus is saying to give it to him as well. No right to hate one trying to deprive us of our possessions. Love even towards him should fill our hearts and reveal itself in our actions. And this is not that it doesn't take a lot of wisdom and insight as to how this plays out in our lives, but you see the over the top generosity and graciousness that has been poured into our lives and to be dispersed to others. Illustration 3, verse 41. Whoever forces you to go one mile, add on another. You know, this third is a reference to the practice of pressing into service, indentured service here. Famous Persian royal post authorized its couriers whenever necessary to press into service anyone available along with their animal, for there was to be no delay in dispatching the king's decrees. To deny the courier was to deny the king. You could be pressed into service. You know, we've got, I, I know this is probably a bad illustration, but it just popped in the head, you know, we've got chores and rules around the house, you know, and so like, just because you, your chore is, you're, it may not be dish night, and I'll, I'll just grab whoever's there, and I'll say, go get the dishes done, because it needs to get done. As soon as I say amen today, we're headed to the coast. I don't care who does it. I don't care if you're on the chore list. Well, but that's not fair. Well, the Romans adopted this policy. Military personnel could require luggage to be hauled one Roman mile. They didn't care who you were. Remember the soldiers compelling Simon of Cyrene to carry Christ's cross? He could not give him any lip. No flack whatsoever. Jesus is saying, rather than exhibit a mean spirit with bitterness or annoyance and the huff and puff that is so innate to who we are, you should take this position with a smile and add another mile. Rather than rebelliously spew forth a heart of bitterness, the true disciple will in cheerfulness of heart add a second Roman mile. This is otherworldly. This is not man left to himself. This is energized by the Spirit of God because of the Son of God's work in our heart. So go ahead. Carry twice as much as commanded and they won't be able to explain your actions as anything short of miraculous because you've experienced the new birth. Illustration 4, verse 42. And this kind of interprets the rest of it. He says, Give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. So this fourth is, is different. It's, it's written different. Jesus taught it differently. There's no doubling. Here is a request instead of a compulsion. Now what the law teach? The law underscored the duty of giving and lending and forbade the selfishness of turning these acts to personal advantage like usury. All through, from cover to cover, the Bible teaches biblical benevolence. Take care of the poor. They need something, give it to them. 
and say you're giving them a loan, don't exact this this horrential interest rate like uh, what just went up in our mortgage rates here in our own country. And take advantage of the situation. You know, when somebody's in distress and they ask for help, give, not grudgingly or, or gingerly, but generously. Lend not selfishly, but liberally or magnanimously. Don't just show kindness, but love kindness. Love the opportunity. Boast in the goodness of God that He brought that opportunity your way to help somebody out rather than pat ourselves on the back at how generous we are. So this, like I said, this verse helped kind of interpret the whole paragraph. The hard attitude of this better righteousness that Jesus is teaching in the Sermon on the Mount is seen here. Rather than retaliation in kind, Return kindness. You friends who are on social media, what's your, what's your post look like? Do you see the gospel in your post rather than get it to somebody who can't get back at you? How do you respond when your family member wrongs you? You know, it gets kind of personal, you know, your own pastor gets kind of, you know, we all go through this together. We can't apply this teaching mechanically. Just fix your heart through the gospel. Come to faith in Christ. God is going to shepherd you through these situations and show you what that application looks like. Grant Osborne in his Matthew commentary put it this way that I thought was helpful. He said, instead of demanding our rights, seeking justice over every wrong, perceived or otherwise, he says, kingdom citizens expect little from this world and place their trust wholly in God. We defer to others and seek at all times to give rather than to take. This is radical departure from Jewish teaching and demands the type of new covenant outlook that's at the heart of Jesus' teaching. This is, in fact, as I've said, impossible without the power of God. Hagner says in his commentary, it's, the unworthy who have experienced the good things of the kingdom. And as they've experienced the surprise of unexpected grace, so they act in a similar manner toward the undeserving among them. Christ has shown that type of mercy and grace toward His enemies and in so doing have provided the model for our actions. When we are developed a a spirit of ingratitude and entitlement, we're not overjoyed at what God did in redeeming our hell-bent souls. You've heard me say before that maybe we need to reduce our expectations of people and increase your love. And Well, as we're increasing our love, realizing that this world is populated by fellow sinners, why don't we also increase our trust in our sovereign God who can get them better than we can in our retaliation? Maybe Micah gives the best summary of this thought. Minor prophet Micah in Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? That's a good question, dear friend. But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. That's a very pregnant verse with a lot of application in our life today and tomorrow should Jesus tarry. Do you do justice? Do you love kindness? Do you walk humbly with your God? Perhaps you'd say to me, well, pastor, I don't know. Well, consider some biblical examples of this attitude with blood and flesh, real historical accounts. How about Abraham? Abraham rushing to rescue his quote-unquote brother, Though Lot had earlier revealed himself to be a very materialistic and greedy nephew, and Abraham is bartering with God to save this guy. How about Joseph? Joseph, we've said before, is the poster child of the Old Testament of injustice, capital I. You know, generously forgiving his brothers, Genesis 50, who had first been thrown into a pit which was Bad enough being left for dead. And they got a, a another better plan. Why don't we go back and take him out of the pit and we'll sell him to slave and make some money on the deal too. And he would say at the end of the account that what you meant for evil, God meant for 
good. That's what this looks like. How about David? Twice sparing the life of his pursuer. King Saul wanted him dead yesterday. And he had it in his hands, the opportunity, and he let it pass. And he asked for, he was so sensitive to his own sinfulness, asked forgiveness for playing around with the one who God himself had anointed. How about Elisha setting bread and water before the invading Syrians in 2 Kings 6? Or Stephen interceding for those who were stoning him to death? Or the pinnacle of the apostles, Paul himself, after his conversion, wrote such things as Romans 12, 21, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome the evil you experience with good. That is not sinful man left himself. That is a work of the Spirit in the heart. How about when he writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 4, 12, that when we are reviled, we bless. And when persecuted, we endure. Or how about the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13? But above all, who is, who is the, the biggest example of what this looks like fleshed out? How about Jesus praying on the cross as He's pushing off, her, off His pierced ankles to gasp for a breath? as He pays the penalty of our sin, and the Father turns His face away, and He breathes out, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. That is so past our ability left to ourselves. This better righteousness was exemplified by our King and His sufferings. In the Gospel of John, John captures this beautifully in John 18, verses 22 and 23. You know, there, here's the, uh, a mock trial. So we're going back to Mark in a couple of weeks. And uh, so the, the false religious trial has already taken place in the Gospel of Mark. We're coming up to Mark 15, and that's what this scenario is here. Jesus is asking, why do you question me? Question those who have heard what I spoke to them. They know what I've said. He said, I've been in the temple with you daily, publicly. When he said this, one of the officers standing nearby struck Jesus saying, is that the way you answer the high priest? Jesus would have been just and righteous to respond. You have no idea who you're dealing with, buddy. But he didn't. He remained silent as he, according to 1 Peter 2, entrusted himself to his Father who judges righteously. And he leaves us this example, that if he entrusts himself to the Sovereign Father, so we do in the atrocities of life. So all these illustrations that Jesus gives in the text are not for shock value alone, nor meant to be new prescriptions to giving endless amounts of money, or if man doesn't work, the Bible says neither should he eat. It's not what we're looking at. The Bible doesn't contradict itself. In verse 40 is clearly hyperbole. No first century Jew would go home wearing only a loincloth. Jesus is speaking over the top. When Jesus says don't resist an evil person, Paul was able to resist, same word as in our text, Resist Peter to his face in Galatians 2 because love demanded that Paul show Peter his hypocrisy. That, uh, you know, remember the scenario where uh, he smells ham on Peter's breath. You know, you're, you're hanging around uh, the, this other group, and when the Jews come along, you only hang with them. The law said an eye for an eye, and yet it missed the link of kindness and could be tended to in personal relationships privately rather than the publicity of court. Not focusing on rights that were violated, but on the divine opportunity for forgiveness and kindness and generosity. And again, it takes wisdom and insight as to those situations of life. The same God who placed the law in the hands of government to punish the evildoer and praise the lawkeeper 
There had to be a system enacted in Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy because of the society of sinful man. But this is the same God who placed the law of love into the hearts of Christ's disciples. The law of Christ written on the hearts of the redeemed comes into play especially when we're wronged. Even Gentiles, Jesus says, love the lovely. Are you willing to love the unlovely? To put me on display? It requires of us gospel-wrought patience and forbearance and willingness to forego our rights and to suffer wrong in order to overcome evil with good. Obedience to this law of love comes from the better righteousness of hearts that have been set free by Christ. I think it's put in lavish, illustrative force with this artist who had a dog that meant more to him than anything in the world for you dog lovers. One day he broke his leg and the artist was panic-stricken. He ran to the telephone and called an acquaintance, a famous surgeon. He says, it's an emergency. A matter of life and death, come quickly. That was it. The startled surgeon dropped everything and rushed to the home of the artist, expecting the worst. When confronted with the dog, this surgeon with masterful self-control said not a word, but proceeded to treat the dog with the same skill he would have used on a human being. Then he simply picked up his instruments and he left. Weeks passed. Dog got well. And yet the artist never received a bill from the surgeon. And it kind of weighed on him. The longer he waited, the more guilty he felt. Surely he had lost the surgeon's friendship forever. A few days later, therefore, he made his way to the surgeon's office intending to pay all that was asked. The surgeon would not accept his check. He said, you're a painter, aren't you? Certainly. Very well. If you'll just put a coat of white paint on that cabinet over there, we'll call the debt settled. While the artist, a good-natured man, was amused by the doctor's clever idea of revenge. He smiled and started to work at once, but when the job was completed, instead of just a coat of white paint, the panels of the surgeon's cabinet bore two of the artist's greatest masterpieces worth thousands of dollars apiece. Beloved, think now of your response then in a situation where your rights are trampled on and what our Master requires of us. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we would confess in utmost decimation and humility that you taught what unredeemed man cannot deliver. Certainly we need a greater righteousness. We cannot work our way into your favor. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So Lord, help us to understand the Christ of Scripture to flee to Him in repentance and faith, and now to practice in deeds the transformation that's occurred in our hearts to put You on display, not ourselves, not our rights, not our desires, so that as an unbelieving world does see our deeds, they might give You glory for Your work. And we'll praise You as well in Christ's name. Amen.